On behalf of the American Geographical Society, welcome to Geography 2050, our annual fall symposium now in its eighth year. This year, our theme is towards a more equitable future. At AGS, we understand our role as the foremost standard bearer for geography and geospatial science. And we believe geographers and all of us involved in the world of geospatial must engage in the conversation surrounding how we move towards a more justice-centered future for all. Equity is an inherently place-based phenomenon, no matter where you are in the world. In fact, research shows inequity is impacted by your longitude and latitude. AGS members and followers have unique skills and insight that can be valuable as we all struggle to make the world a better place. We are hoping the discussions we begin this week will be useful in pursuing this more equitable future and provide geo expertise as decision makers and everyday citizens consider how they will act. No matter what area you focus on, the pandemic, inflation, unemployment, the Academy Awards, access to food and housing, healthcare, unstable governments, even space exploration, one cannot help but notice the inequity that exists virtually everywhere. Now, it would be very naive to suggest that we should embark on a journey to make everything and everyone equal, and we are not suggesting this. But it does make sense to most people that we must make progress towards a more justice-centered future when it involves the survival of humanity or the ability of people to live a decent life that at the very least allows for basic necessities to live an opportunity to thrive and grow. Inequity that threatens our survival and causes people to suffer by merely living must be addressed. And we all have a responsibility to do our part. AGS has a proud history, but like all organizations, we have made mistakes and decisions and actions along the way. We cannot change what our history has recorded, but we can do now our part to move forward. Forward to a more equitable future. Our symposium this year is just that, our part. We don't pretend to have all the answers or even know what all the questions are, but we are committed to do better. We are committed to push change and not just let it happen on its own. We are committed to use geography and geospatial science to make the world better. And we are confident that our use of geography and geospatial science will result in a more equitable future. So thank you. Thank you for joining us this week. Thank you for sharing your thoughts and ideas on this topic. And thank you for your commitment towards a more equitable future. AGS is very lucky to have at its helm two people whose names are synonymous with geography and geospatial science. They understand deeply the responsibility of AGS to actively participate in the equitable conversation. And they both had the foresight over a year ago to champion this symposium from the very beginning. It gives me great pleasure to begin our symposium with an introduction by our chairman, Dr. Christopher Tucker, and our president, Dr. Marie Price. Marie? Thanks, John. And thank you for joining this year's symposium. We began developing this theme over two years ago. What inspired this topic was our recognition of the challenges of economic inequality and its dynamic patterning across the surface of the earth. These differences are driven by many factors, including state and local policies, investment decisions, natural resource base, a changing climate, and discrimination by race, gender, ethnicity, and age. Our mission at AGS is to be the foremost champion of geography for the benefit of society. We believe that the use of spatial thinking and geospatial tools would be critical to measure our progress and to build a more equitable future. This is a difficult topic, but such an important one. Our aim was to be forward-looking and oriented to solving problems and finding solutions. To do this, we reached out to a broad and diverse group of presenters from academia, industry, government, and civil society, 
to make this the most diverse gathering in the eight years of Geography 2050's history, something we're very proud of. This event would not be possible without the thoughtful guidance and intellectual contributions of Dr. Amy Glassmeyer, our symposium chair. I also want to recognize the entire organizing committee for their efforts in building the program. Andrea D'Amato, Kenan Fickrey, Dr. D. Jordan, Dr. Robin Lachenko, Dr. Chris Tucker, and Dr. Joseph Wood. For many years, we have included educators in this event, especially AP Human Geography teachers. AP Human Geography is now one of the top 10 AP exams in the country with a quarter million students taking the exam each year. AP Geography teachers are leading the effort across the United States to advance geographic education for a new generation of students. When we meet in person, we usually have 50 Geography teacher fellows. Our virtual format allows for hundreds of teachers to join us. I'm especially pleased to share that two teacher fellows will be in our program this year, Celeste Reynolds and Greg Hill. As a reminder, we will be hosting the Saturday morning workshop at 11 a.m. for teachers, so please sign up for that. To reach a wider audience, we made the decision to make this an open access event. So all these talks will be available to you online through our website, not just this week, but throughout the year. Save your favorite talks, share them with friends, use them in classes. We do ask that you consider making a tax deductible contribution to Geography 2050. There's a donate button on the site. It only takes a moment. Your support will allow us to share Geography 2050 events going forward so that the ideas and policies suggested can reach a diverse and broad audience. And now I invite Chris Tucker, the chair of AGS, to share a few remarks. Chris. Thank you, Marie, for your thoughtful introduction of this very important subject. Inequality manifests geographically, shaping the landscape of our lives in so many ways and along so many dimensions that it's, it's often difficult to make sense of it all. As Marie already said, Geography 2050 is a multi-year strategic dialogue about the vital trends that will reshape the geography of our planet over the coming decades. While we have addressed so many different classes of trends over the last seven years of Geography 2050 Symposia, geographic inequality strikes me as something different in kind. As we look at our world through this lens of geographic inequality, we find ourselves peeling back the covers of some of the most troubling parts of our societies and even our interpersonal relationships that systematically undermine the well being and future success of our neighbors, our fellow citizens, and even our friends and family. While our selfish selves and our self centered selves naturally focus on how we can live in the best neighborhood keep crime far away from us, place our children in the best schools and enjoy natural landscapes for ourselves, our more empathetic selves demand that we think geographically, that we understand the patterns of the geographic inequality, which may be out of our sight or over the horizon. Our empathetic selves quest to understand why structural disadvantages persist in neighborhoods or regions or in nations around the other side of the world. Our empathetic selves demand more data, and to see it plotted on a map so that we can understand what our communities, our corporations, and our governments can do to help lift up our fellow man. As we set our sights on creating a more equitable future for all of humanity, we will only succeed if we first begin by thinking geographically, marshalling geographic data and insights about our fast changing world, and developing geographically grounded strategies for removing the structural barriers that separate us and begin investing in a more equal future for all. I would like to thank our longtime partners, Columbia, Columbia University's Earth Institute, the Fund for the City of New York, the Open Geospatial Consortium, and the US Geospatial Intelligence Foundation for their support in making Geography 2050 a success. I would like to thank our sponsors. Without their financial support, we would not have been able to produce this important conversation and the content that you can share with your friends, your neighbors and colleagues, your students and your fellow teachers. By name, I would like to thank ESRI, the Economic Innovation Group, the American Association of Geographers, National Geographic, Black Cape, and Alliance Bernstein. 
It is also important to thank our corporate angels, companies that provide $2,000 annually to support AGS's geography teacher and education programs. We appreciate their commitment to the cause and we encourage all of your companies and organizations to become corporate angels. I would like to thank our digital producer, Adam Simmons and Project Geospatial, the online content community, community that he has curated over the years for their support in making Geography 2050 a success. Please make sure to tune in to Project Geospatial for more rich content on how geospatial tech shapes our world. And like Marie, I also would like to thank Professor Amy Glassmeyer for taking the lead as this year's Geography 2050 program chair, leading a team of wonderful and thoughtful individuals that helped curate the important collection of talks and panels you will see over the next five days. We appreciate her hard work and inspiration and that of the larger program committee. Thank you, Chris. Hello. My name is Amy Glassmeyer, and I'm a professor at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology's Department of Urban Studies and Planning. At MIT, I teach undergraduate students to be professionals in the field of urban and regional planning. At MIT, I also operate the Living Wage Calculator, a tool built in 2003 with a colleague of mine named Tracy Farragan, who works at the US Department of Agriculture's Economic Research Service. When Tracy and I built that tool, the economy was in recession and we were working with local governments to try to inform them about what to do when economies crash. We basically realized that the, the leaders in many communities didn't actually really understand what happens when economic crisis hits. The tool was designed to allow people to understand what their costs were and it also allowed policymakers to recognize what they needed to do when communities were lo losing their livelihoods and were in danger of losing things like their houses and their cars. That's just one example of the uncertainty that we live with in our lives today. And also for many people, the, the way I describe the problem of the, the e economic uncertainty is something that many people in the United States and around the world also experienced the sense of economic insecurity. My background is in economic development. My work is focused on some of the poorest regions in the United States, from Appalachia to the US-Mexico border, to the Mississippi Delta, to the South Atlantic coast, to the, the Copper Belt of the Midwest and Native American lands. In each case, those areas once had thriving economies, but today those economies are thriving no more. Unfortunately, for most of them, what was expected was something to grow again, but it hasn't. And so these are places which are economically fragile and they are looking at dark um, circumstances. And the question is, what has this done? Well, basically, over the last 35 years, we've seen growing income and, and wealth inequality in the United States. And in some cases, that those two factors are what we see now in many of these communities. And so in thinking about the question of equality in the United States, we have to ask ourselves, what is it that we can do to address some of the major issues that are facing our nation today? My research for the last 25 years has focused on finding answers to questions about how we can design economic policies to lift up the lives of Americans who live in areas like I described, where resources are scarce, environments are harsh, and opportunities are limited. This week, Savent will shine the light on some of the nation's poor, toughest problems and also offer practical and informed solutions to gaps in opportunity. Today is the culmination of more than two years of work on behalf of the board and members of the American Geographical Society. The event is the seventh in a series of symposia focusing on the challenges facing the world as we approach the year 2050. We are looking specifically through a geographic lens. This week, once again, we are taking up a topic of overarching importance to the world, and it is perhaps the toughest and most important topic to date. How can we achieve greater equality by 2050? 
There may be no more important issue facing the world today than the growing inequality both within and between countries. From climate change impacts and their effects on citizens of low-lying nations who are being washed into the sea to the centuries long consequences of enslavement of peoples around the world, to the deleterious effects of health disparities, to the inequality of access to resources that enable humanity to live safe and secure lives and to thrive over a lifetime. The focus of this week is both on the description of some of the challenges that we face as the world confronts disasters, famines, and lack of access to resources to inform discussions of pathways toward solutions to a more equitable future. We will hear about parts of the nation and the world where inequality is endemic. And we also will see examples of and hear talks about experiencing experiences of problem solving efforts that are making the world a healthier and fairer place for people to thrive. I'd like to give you an overview of what we're going to be seeing over the course of the next week. The event has uh, four major parts. We have panels, we have lightning talks, we have book reviews, and we have spotlights. We also have a daily quiz on the session contents of the day. So pay a close attention to ensure that you will be able to knock your answer out of the park. Some of the themes that we'll be looking at are such things as equity and shelter, building the inclusive city, climate change and global justice, and right-sizing transportation to meet the needs of underserved um, communities. We'll also see presentations made by Youth Mappers uh, Ambassadors Panel on Mapping for Greater Equity. We'll hear a series of keynotes from eminent individuals from around the world that will talk about such wide ranging topics as um, equity uh, development in the global south, um, how we can use technology and in particular, how can we use geographic understanding to make inroads in um, areas where endemic inequality exists, to hearing from policymakers who have thought deeply about the subject of inequality. And finally, we will also hear about the, the ability of new technology and science to give us greater insights and aperture onto some of the world's biggest environmental and social problems. Today's discussion is going to focus on uh, building the inclusive city from wealthy enclaves to asset deserts will be our lightning talk. We'll have a book review on furthering fair housing. And we will hear a lightning or a spotlight talk, creating a more equitable learning environment and a world through mapping. I'd now like to turn and introduce our keynote speaker for the day. Mr. Maurice A. Jones. Mr. Jones is president and CEO of 110. One Mr. Jones was appointed CEO of 110 in March, 2021. 110 is a coalition of leading chief executives and their companies who are coming together to upskill, hire and promote 1 million black Americans over the next 10 years who do not yet have four-year degree and to promote them into family sustaining jobs with opportunities for investment. Prior to joining 110, Maurice was the president of the Local Initiative Support Corporation. LISC is one of the country's largest community development organizations supporting projects to revitalize communities and catalyze economic development for resident, residents. During his time at LISC, Maurice led the company's effort to expand its footprint to the southern part of the United States, where some of the poorest and the least resourced communities in the country reside. He grew the company's annual investment from a billion to $2 billion. He also increased the economic development investments that LISC has made throughout the country and created a subsidiary company dedicated specifically to small business lending. During his tenure at LISC, 
Maurice diversified its partnerships with multiple industries, including healthcare, technology, sports, retail, and advanced manufacturing. Mr. Jones has had an illustrative career um, far beyond what I just said. He previously served as the Secretary of Commerce and Trade for the Commonwealth of Virginia, where his primary job was to utilize Virginia's assets to solidify its position as the preeminent place to live, work, and conduct business. He also served as Deputy Secretary for the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development from April 2012 to 20, uh, January 2014. As the second most senior official at HUD, Maurice managed the department's day-to-day -day operations with an annual operating budget of 40 billion and an agency's 8,900 employees. Before his appointment at HUD, Maurice was the president of Pilot Media, the largest print and digital organization in Hampton Roads, Virginia. He joined Landmark Media Enterprises, owner of Pilot in 2014, 2005, and he became vice president and general manager of Pilot Media in 2008 and finally president in the next year. Maurice was also a commissioner of the Virginia Department of Social Services and deputy chief of staff to the then governor, Mark Warner. Other positions that he's held include special assistant and general counsel at the U.S. Department of Treasury, legal counsel to the community development finance institutions, the CDFIs, fund and director of the fund during the Clinton administration, associate attorney at Hunton and Williams in Richmond, Virginia, and partner of venture, of venture philanthropy partners. Maurice received a bachelor's of art in political science from Hampton Sydney College and attended Oxford University on a Rhodes Scholarship where he received a Master of Philosophy in International Relations. He later received a Juris Doctorate for the University of Virginia. One thing I can say about Maurice personally is that he cares deeply about the, the issues of injustice and opportunity. And he's always an optimist when it comes to finding a way to deal with challenges that are vexing and are um, growing in some instances and need to be addressed. So thank you, Maurice, for being our first keynote.